Well, hello, it is Sarah Jane from Vital Animal Talk. And today I want to speak more to this uh, energy of missing or tracking lost animals, specifically cats, because I get so many people in my practice that come to me because their cats have gone walkabout. And I know many of you have seen me in person or worked with me or seen me speak. So I want to just get right into to the subject, which is really that in my years of working with animals in communications, in shelter, um, I've seen thousands and thousands of animals um, in shelters not being claimed. And I started to question why people weren't uh, finding their animals in the shelters. And I wondered why so many of these once loved, well cared for cats and other animals why are they never found and reunited with their animals? And this is millions of animals that go missing every year around the world. And the majority of these animals never get back home again because they either get kept by other people or they're absorbed into free roaming populations of feral cats or they end up in shelters uh, where they're euthanized because nobody wants them. And the majority of these cats, other than underage kittens, are often strays. Some are surrenders, and there are other reasons why cats end up in shelters. But if you talk to any shelter direction or people that are feeding stray cats, or you know, people have picked these cats up because they they meant well and they thought they were in need of of assistance, and they've brought them to a shelter. And that happened to me myself when I moved to Johannesburg. And I brought my, my cat, Satchmo, a beautiful Burmese that had been through thick and thin with me for many, many years. And he integrated beautifully into my new family of cats. And when I had my daughter, um, he was pretty happy. Uh, he wasn't upset because he'd always been my baby. But he started to go, go away from home for longer and longer periods of times. And I would gestalt track him. I would find him. I would bring him home and he he found another family that he said he would prefer to be with and he is he needed to fulfill his soul contract um with these people now because his work with me was done and I didn't want to accept that that was what he was choosing um and I I really resisted honoring his his request to let him let him be and let him live out his days with his new family and this is what I find very jerk very tricky when I am often hired by people who absolutely love their cats and dogs and, and animals and sometimes they are very adamant that hey this is what I'm choosing I don't want to be here anymore and it's very hard for us as humans who get attached we love them as our children and we want them to stay with us and it's not easy but you know, one of the things that I saw is that a majority of the cats that I've seen in shelters are most likely owned. And more importantly for us as professionals, we need to look at what can we do differently? How can we change the situation um, to get more cats back to their, their people? And a few reasons that I've discovered getting to know people in my work and through my research is why is this so? And I don't have all the answers. But I do have a few areas where we can actually start broadening our perspective and looking at the whole picture. And one of the reasons why animals leave home is, is not known. Um, you know, oftentimes with a cat, they don't know what to do. They may not even know that their cat is missing. So the, the owner's behavior and the people around them, um, people who find cats, are also a factor you know they might not know what to do they might take action that they believe is right um, which which inhibits the cat getting back to their home and if some of you've heard me speak about how how some of the barriers to reclaim in shelters uh, make it very hard for people to come back into shelters and get their cats back especially if they're not chipped so I want to talk a little bit about history here and you know why do I want to talk about this well, I want to look at what are we doing now? What are so many of my clients doing that are working in shelters? And I think it's important to understand where we're coming from so that we know why we have the practice that we have in shelters and rescue centers. And most of the time, if you ask someone in a shelter why they do this and that, it's because they say, well, that's the way it's always been done. Or they might come up with some reason 
that's not very logical. You know, it's not in the cat's best interest or the dog's best interest, but that's how it's always been. And so animal control and management departments are largely were created to manage dogs. And this was back in the day when dogs were partially roaming wild. Many people lived on farms. Populations were much lower around the world. Um, they were concentrated in towns in certain areas. But, you know, the concerns with people and animals that were, you know, running around loose were, were a concern of rabies and also killing livestock. So these were some of the problems that were there then and why these animal control um, people were put in place by the governments was to control the situations. And, and cats were always kind of there in the background, killing, on, killing mice, living on farms or, or stables, especially where... Um, where horses were used for transportation, cats were brought in to manage the rat population, stop them getting into the grain and the food. And obviously this has changed over the, the years where cats were started to see more as household pets that shouldn't be allowed to roam, um, that should be taken care of and in the house and um, brought to shelters. In so many ways has been worse for cats because they were used to, you know, being wild and roaming around outside. And now when people see cats outside, a lot of people think, oh gosh, this cat needs to be rescued and I need to take it to a shelter. And, you know, if, you, if you've if been in this before, you know what happens next. Oftentimes the outcome is not good for cats and it hasn't been for many, many years. So, <coughs> you know, these early animal shelters... Um, which a lot of them are pretty much still operating and, and, and are still the same structures that were built in the 60s and the 70s. And they were designed for dogs, not cats. And you can see this very clearly. If you walk into older shelters, you'll see some sort of an office or an old house with some dog kennels in it or some you know cages attached to it. And that was how they were designed. They were designed for holding dogs, not cats. Cat rooms are basically other rooms. Um, that have been repurposed and you can clearly tell that they, that maybe it was a storage room or an old office or a broom closet and somebody put some cages in there and said this is the cat room and unfortunately many cats are still housed this way today in rooms that aren't designed for animals to live in and they don't have adequate ventilation and they don't have other things that they actually need for their health to be um, maintained uh, Okay, it's, it's always compromises the immune system. So I want to look at some assumptions rather than facts that are very common still around the globe in, in regards to, um, you know, the caring and the management of, of cats that have been roaming and brought into shelters um, and dogs as well. But mostly I want to talk about cats today because they're the hardest ones when I track to get reunited with their people and oftentimes I have found my own cat there uh, because someone had picked him up in the rain, dropped him off at the vet and two or three days later he'd gone to a shelter and I just happened to come across him when I was actually there doing work with another client. And here's the thing, many people let their cats go outside for better or worse um, you know, and but in reality, many people don't want to keep their pets inside. And of course, there there are community cats who have multiple owners, and and they're they're there to go. And I don't even like to use owners. I think we're servants to cats. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but you know, many many people that that have ended up with their cats in shelters have been picked up outside their own homes, and a lot of these shelters are focusing on cats when they're able to spend more time speaking to people um, they're able to do a lot more reclaims because they're starting to learn what's happening out there in the world rather than you know just making assumptions that this cat was lost or roaming around and needed help <coughs> excuse me and you know I was just as guilty as the next person when it came to responsibilities or judging other people as irresponsible because they couldn't take care of their pets and that's why they went running away until I actually started talking to the animals and talking to the pets because you know not everybody takes the greatest care over their pets but we have to assume that all people are good they love their animals and they certainly want the opportunity to find and reclaim them but in reality many people don't know about animal shelters or they don't want to go there I mean we know I certainly know because I work a lot there 
um, with, with animals in, in shelters that are suffering from trauma with my trust process. Um, and you know what? There are so many people and a lot of people out there are getting their cats um, from internet or from breeders, but they're not going to shelters. You know, it's not the first place they think of going if they want to adopt a cat. And many owners don't start looking when their cats go missing right away, especially for cats, because we know that cats wander. And a lot of these cats that are in the shelters, I always used to ask people, when did your cat go missing? And they'll say, oh, about two weeks ago. And then I ask, you know, when did you start looking? And they go, oh, you know, yesterday, because he usually wanders around and he visits my neighbors. So there isn't the urgency that they would be there that, with a dog, for instance, because cats are more independent. And as I mentioned, there's many barriers for reclaiming. So it's not as if people are not trying to get their cats back. They just don't know where to start or or they're not able to. So just know that a shelter is the, is not the safest place for a cat. And we're, we're the first to blame for promoting that shelters are doing a good job in keeping animals safe. And they're saying, you know, be part of the solution, spay and neuter, chip your animals. Um, and we've been saying for decades, shelters are good and this is where we need to bring animals in that need to be rescued to keep them safe. And, you know, there's certainly a place for animal shelters. But it's not necessarily a place where we want to just bring every roaming cat as if you're doing, if you're helping. And we need to know, you know, the main cost of, of animals and the medical implications of animals in shelters is stress induced. And stress can be a killer. Their immune systems go down and they get sick. And the shelter is the le most least likely place that the, the owner of that cat is going to look. Um, and then we have to look at the antiquated facilities of a lot of these processes. And I want you to get, I'm not being down on animal shelters and the people that work there. Most of the folks out there are good and caring and they want the best for these animals. But they're not aware of all these other issues. They're not aware of all these barriers, which is why I think it's so important for us to be, to educate people in shelters and the people that have cats as um, their companions. And this is a big one, impounding cats. Okay, this is one of the myths that impounding cats health helps control the population. And many people believe this. Um, and, and a lot of good people felt that if we didn't take responsibility for the ferals, and if we didn't euthanize um, or sterilize cats, that populations would explode, that it would be completely out of control and it would be so much worse. And we see this in places like Turkey and Greek where the, the population is out of control, but that's part of their life. And just know, you know, shelters, shelters don't, 5% um, of most people, cats, it's more like one to 3% that actually get reunited because nobody actually knows where these cats came from. And these figures are based on, on owned animals where animals um, have, have had homes and, you know, a while ago, I gave a talk where I mentioned that, you know, sort of 70% was questioned. So I don't make any guarantee about that number of, of how many animals actually are euthanized um, and, and how many of this free reigning population actually do die just because of the elements and that our interference um, doesn't help. You know, um, I've heard 50%, I've heard a huge percent of the population, far more than half, year after year after year, are actually, are, are euthanized. And actually all people are taking in is 5% of that. So, you know, unless these are targeted sterilization process, programs or um, rehoming pro programs, isn't really working very well, okay? And, and this is across the world, you know, the, the reclaim rates are very poor. You know, 5% or less for most shelters. And I've conducted a couple of studies um, just in, in the area that I live. And I saw these numbers to be pretty abysmal across the board of how many cats are actually rehomed. And, you know, I think there was like 18 claimed out of like 4,000. And often the kittens get homed before the big, big cats or the older cats. But it's the, the figures are still not a very good result. And, you know, I just believe that without a proactive program, nothing's going to change. And another factor which I discovered, 
and I first started walking on, working on, um, you know, back in the day um, when I was very involved with, with the feral cat feeding programs. Um, you know, it was just, I started to see a pattern and one of one of those patterns was that we were were not adopting out more than fifty percent of the animals that 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 we were coming in. And it wasn't that we were euthanizing fifty percent. There were other positive outcomes where their owners were reclaimed. But you know, in when all was said and done, they were going into foster or going into rescue groups or they were being transferred to other shelters um, in the hopes that they would be adopted in a different, in a different location. So all we were doing was moving and shifting the problems around. Um, we wanted a positive outcome, but they weren't permanent outcomes. So we were, you know, most certainly back then very in favor of adoption processes, but I think we just need to be aware that that is not the only answer to this problem. You know, um, Another thing I hear all the time from, from these organizations and shelters is, oh, we're full, we can't take in any more pets, and tearing your hair out because a lot of these shelters are overburdened, and you can hear all this great advice, but you just can't deal with it, you know, and this is why it's good, especially going into winter, that this is the time to plan for next spring, right? We're always looking for ways, uh, when I work with shelters and sanctuaries, to to expand and the good news is that even if you these shelters implement one or two of these best practices the ones that have have started to see really good results and you know i don't believe that everything has to be perfect nothing is ever 100 percent congruent but whatever you do any change even if there's a five percent improvement it's an improvement you know this is working in a compassionate way with the animals and that's what I want to see more of. And one of the shelters that I work with I have a very proactive program. And they do a lot of, of things like microchipping and free sterilization. Um, they've been doing it for a number of years. And um, they have a good education for the informal settlements on how to take care for their animals. Um, you know, but I'm not talking about big shelters that have 10 or 20,000 intake. But they're doing very well in their communities. Because these are some of the practices that the, the larger shelters are starting to take on. And I'm starting to see an improvement in that. So I want to talk about some missing pet behavior. Because this is something that is very misunderstood by a lot of people. And, you know, I talk about this all the time. And I think one of the most important things is to know that missing pet pets are going to behave very differently to the way that they do in a safe a homely environment so if you're saying here kitty 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 the cat's probably not going to run up to you if they're outside of their normal natural environment their home and they're going to be frightened so if you are counseling over something around um, missing pets and this is what I do is look at are they indoor or outdoor cats because this is going to com communicate how we start start that that gestalt tracking with the cat and, you know, I want to, you know, think about, um, I had a client um, that reached out to me because her kitty had gone missing and she'd been sure that this cat had got out of the apartment. Even though she hadn't seen her, she was very distraught. She called all over the neighborhood. She was handing out flyers. She was talking to the businesses in her area, but nobody had seen this kitty. And after speaking with her, I said to her, she needs to look more close to home inside the building because she lived in an apartment and this was an indoor cat. So they very rarely wander far. And sure enough, a couple of days later, she called me back and, and told me her kitty was safely back at home. And it turned out that it was hot during the summer and people had left their doors open in the apartment uh, to get some airflow. And what the kitty had gone across the hall and was in her landlord's ap apartment, ha you know, just hanging out there. And these people were, were, were feeding them. So, you know, it's just like, the important thing to remember is, especially indoor cats, but all cats, is that they're not going to go very far from home. It's not like um, the two-year husky that can run five miles before you even realize that you left the gate open and he's gone uh, for a run. So it's very important to understand as well that they may appear feral in a shelter. They look wild because they're in that fight-flight survival response. And I've seen this in situations where... Um, folks have had to use a humane trap to catch their own cat because when they're outside, they're incredibly frightened and you can't just walk up to them and put them up, pick them up. 
So you have to put a humane trap down. And boy, when they get in there, they're hissing, they're crouching, and they're looking exactly like we would call a feral cat. Now, the outdoor cat might be a little bit further away. They're going to have a, bit, a wider range, a, a bigger zone of territory. And the important thing to remember with an outdoor cat is if they don't show up for their 6 o'clock feeding time or when their normal routine is, that something has happened to them. Maybe they've got stuck somewhere. Maybe they're injured. Um, they might have been displaced, right? Which is typically when they've been chased by an aggressive cat or by a dog or they got frightened by a car. We need to figure out what's happened in order to find them, especially if they're injured, right? We need to, to get to them quickly. Um, you know, the shy cat, and I wouldn't have believed this if I hadn't seen it a thousand times, and I heard another story about this the other day, that these cats can hide without eating or drinking for days, sometimes weeks, and it doesn't sound possible, but it actually is. And some of these cats who've been found um, later died due to organ failure, but the majority of them, um, you know, with some port of care, with some hydration, have they've gone on to live happy, healthy lives. So I think it's important for you, for you to understand that even if you've looked around, you need to keep looking. You can't give up. You need to tell your animal that you're going to wait for as long as it takes and you're still actively looking for them because they may actually be stuck or hiding somewhere for days or weeks and still be alive. So the outgoing cat, this is the kitty that'll, that'll follow you down the street if you go for a walk. They might actually travel far from home. They might follow other people if they have that kind of temperament. But if they're out and they're in trouble, these are the kind of cats that will look to people for help. They'll approach people. And these are the cats that may be, quote unquote, rescue because somebody sees them and thinks they've been abandoned and picks them up and for safety takes them to a shelter Unfortunately, a lot of people don't ask to try and find the owner or, or look around their neighborhood to see if people are missing. So I want to talk about, um, you know, a search method um, because I do, as I said, a lot of gestalt tracking. It's not easy work. Uh, sometimes it feels like looking uh, for a needle in a haystack because cats and dogs, when they're on the move or they're not feeling safe enough to talk to me or they're busy keeping themselves safe, can't talk to me. And when we look at um, what they see from their level, you know, what it takes is not the internet, not all sorts of other things, but just exhaustively physically looking and then hiring an animal communicator like me that can just gestalt track and give extra information and also um, give the animal uh, energetic healing if they are injured or frightened so that they can communicate and tell me from their level what they can see and, and give me some clues and I, I've had many cases where um, these animals especially the ones that are street wise and have been outside and have seen more than the inside of their indoor cats living room um, they're really smart and when I ask them you know what can you see yes it's frustrating because we're thinking about it from our level of sight and we have to put ourselves down onto the level that they would be looking up. So if I'm asking, you know, what can you see? And I get a cat that said, I had a, a dog once that, that kept telling me he could smell basil. I kept getting this strong smell of basil. And lo and behold, yes, it was a search, but eventually the, that dog was found very close to Basil Street, which is where I had initially tracked him to. So we have to look at both, you know, the big picture and the, and the small picture. You know, one woman that I was helping, we have to look at our surroundings. Um, and, you know, this woman was looking around looking for her cat and people didn't know what she was doing. So they called the police because she looked a little bit suspicious. You don't want to trespass on other people's properties. You do want to recommend, if possible, to check the neighbor's yards and in the bushes and under the deck and ask them if they can open. But if the neighbor doesn't give you commission, permission, and this is where it's been very, very frustrating for me in many cases where I've tracked an animal to a specific home and the person has decided, no, they like this cat and they want to keep them. And it's very frustrating without getting the police involved, which sometimes we've had to do in order to gain access to get the cat back. But, you know, it's not always easy. And especially if you live in a country like South Africa, where we're living behind six foot walls with electric fences, 
um, sometimes the cats cannot get back onto the property. Um, so we have to really explore all of the um, possibilities. So getting your neighbors involved in a search is also extremely, extremely um, useful because they have eyes and people are aware. And I had um, another, another woman that had a cat called Fluffy, very original, and she lived with a whole lot of other cats um, in an apartment. And this woman used to um, open the windows and she looked around, all the other cats were there, but Fluffy had gone. So she did all the right things. She looked around, she did a physical search. She looked for other black cats that looked like her cat. And it was very challenging because, um, you know, she was handing out flyers to people and she also put them on her door. She contacted the vets, she contacted her local shelters and actually physically went there. And when people called her, um, she, she put more of her cards and her flyers on. But as it turned out, she was in an area that she hadn't been looking. Even though this cat was an indoor cat and he lived in an apartment, he'd gone a couple of blocks away and she was out looking for him, following some of the tips that she got from the calls and the flyers and she looked for him she didn't see him she didn't hear him walked back home and of course that night he reappeared so I, I my insight is that when when she walked through the area that she hadn't looked before and walked back home and also called the cat that she left a scent trail and then the cat might have maybe not heard her and didn't feel comfortable or safe enough to come back um, he waited until nightfall. They always seem more comfortable to travel at night when it's when it's more quiet and he found his way back home. So, you know, microchips, when they first came out, we were so excited. We thought um, they were going to solve all our problems. Unfortunately, they didn't. Um, but I recommend that all your animals be chipped and registered for owners to understand um, that, you know, it's not a GPS. Um, your vet probably didn't register register it for you or your shelter so make sure that you register make sure you're on the database and and put you know keep your details updated so many times as well I've had cats that have been located with a chip in their backs or dogs and we you know when we've looked up the information on on the pet uh, tracking details that person has moved states or moved to a different province and not updated their records. So please, if your animals are chipped, and I hope that they are, make sure that the details are updated. And every couple of, of months, take when your animal's at, at a shelter or you're going past your vet, just ask them to do a quick scan to make sure that that, that chip is still able to be read because sometimes they get themselves in a bind and and the chips stop working or the body rejects them and you think the chip's in and meanwhile the chip has, is not in your animal anymore. Um, you know, another practical way is make sure that when you put posters up, think about it that cars are going past those street lights or that freeway and you don't even see it, right? Because your poster isn't clear enough to get a split second read on it. So, you know, a lot of times uh, lost posters <coughs> tend to be used for dogs but they you know they can be helpful if you're not getting any leads on looking for your cat and you just want to get the word out make sure that your poster is clearly visible from a moving car okay because people aren't taking their time and having time to stare on it and also of course make sure that there aren't any restrictions put them in on, on gates or lampposts, um, make sure that you're allowed to do that so that they're not removed. And, you know, you want to be really critical. I don't uh, like people to put rewards out on those posters because there's lots of scams. And it also, for me, in my opinion, it, it encourages people, especially in third world countries, to actually go ahead and steal people's beloved animals because they know um, that they're family and they know that people are emotionally attached to their animals and that they will pay anything to get them back. So I don't like to offer, um, offer a reward because I think that it, that it brings in a lot of other energy that promotes people's animals being stolen. But, you know, you want to make sure when you put your posters up, make sure that you don't have a picture that gets rained on and gets washed out. Make sure it's very clear 
fluffy missing um make sure that there's a telephone number there that these days with people's smartphones if they think they've seen the cat they can take a photograph of of your poster on the way way back and keep it top of mind um so that so that it actually works okay um you know i hear about this every day every post on facebook is sort of recommending this other myth that if you put out a dirty cat box that your pet will come home and this is this does not work okay um, most cats are already close to home we know that they're just hiding because they're frightened because they're injured or because something's happened to them smelling a cat box especially a dirty one is not a motivating factor for them to come home okay um, another myth that I hear a lot is my cat's left because he's gone off to die and the reason for this is because old cats are often found in the bushes or in the garage or away from from their home after they've passed away and the problem I have with this belief is that if what we see in reality in the shelters is that cats that are older um, not doing very well they have kidney disease or thyroid issues like my Winston did they become disoriented so they hide because they're not feeling well or or they can't find their way back home or they're too weak to find their way back home so yes they will die because they need medical attention not because they have some human-like prefrontal thought that I'm going to die and I'm going to go away to do that this is just not how I've seen animals um, work you know some people believe that they've been their animal might be killed by a wild animal um, and you know it's a lot less common than you might think that that happens yes there are some areas um, in the bush where where there is a problem with snakes or um, uh, wild dogs where they will get eaten by wild animals and coyotes are another one that is a big one in my American um, clients population but most populations it's pretty uncommon because you know people I think use that as an excuse to give up and stop looking and I don't want you to stop looking um, you know I had a one of my clients Tessa one of her farm dogs a little bit elderly um, also she re recognized he wasn't he was missing and when she contacted me um, she, he had a wide range to to follow and and he used to wander and go and visit uh, the people and eat from from the workers that worked on the farm but it was he'd been gone a little bit too long and when we when I tracked him and I asked him are you still in your body and he said no Tessa wanted to, to find his body right if possible she wanted to find his body they wanted closure they wanted to do some ritual and ceremony to honor this dog's life and and, and what he'd meant in in their home and in the pack and 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 really honor that in a in a burial in a, in a beautiful ceremony a, um, a celebration ceremony for the dog and uh, originally when I tapped in for the uh, first time I tapped into his energy he showed me a big snake and I automatically went into going okay he's been bitten by a snake when we actually found his body we did find the snake uh, that, that he had been po bitten by a snake but it had actually been a wild uh, hyena that had ripped out his entrails and and started to eat him in the dying process so you know it isn't it isn't the norm put it that way unless you're living on a farm or you're living in the wild that that's going to happen and it's not a reason for you to stop looking for your animal but you know another one of the problems that i see is that when people focus only on where well, i might intuit um that they actually don't do the physical search of going to the shelter of doing the other things that they need to do which i give to people when they first um, contact me to assist them in tracking their missing pets is have you done here's the checklist go and make sure that you've done all the practical checks and you need to actively participate in going to the shelters so many times i've had people say yes well i phoned the shelters and the problem is is that the staff there are normally understaffed and there are not um, people that are very forward thinking and they're dealing with hundreds of animals as as a you know sort of very low income um, job 
So you can phone and you could get somebody on the phone that, that says, no, we haven't had an animal in like that. And I have had this happen to me, as I've said, a couple of times where I have spoken to that animal and it's been, you need to come and look for me at this shelter, not today, but in, but it, it, the next day. And why? Because sometimes in the timing <coughs> of that, the cat's been taken to the to the person that's picked it up closest vet, which could be miles from where the cat live, and then the and then there's a certain day that the shelters actually pick up all these cats and dogs that have been dropped off at vets, and they're taken into the shelter and then admitted into the general population. And this is where timing is so crucial sometimes, and why I am so insistent on. I can meet you there. I can support you, but you have to do the groundwork. It's up to you to keep looking, keep going there, and don't rely on a telephone call to a shelter saying, have you seen my cat? When there's, you know, maybe some days an intake of 20 or 30 cats into the shelter or 50 dogs into the shelter that they're going to know what your cat looks like. All right, so... Um, you know, it's it's money better spent making flyers, making posters, getting in the car and going there. You know, there's another scam where people claim to have your animals. And this is the rewards that I was talking about where they demand money. And I've seen this a lot more common with dogs, but I've seen it with cats as well, where the person will respond to an advert or a poster because people are offering a reward. And a lot of time they'll even threaten to harm the animal if they don't get the money and this is just plain wrong when people are emotionally attached and they're distraught and I always tell people if someone is claiming to have your pet and demanding money to have it returned ask them to send you a picture everybody has a phone today and there's no reason why they can't give you a photograph and again this is like visible proof for a ransom note if they can't do that no it's just a scam and and move on okay um, I want to examine also some of the, the humans um, involved with the missing cats because this can be a huge problem, you know, where some people um, aren't that attached. They'll just go get, an, get another animal. But for those of us who are really attached to our animals and they're part of our family, especially if someone has only one cat and they don't have children or that cat or dog is very meaningful to them, they are going to be as grief stricken as if it was a person, sometimes more so. And they can't handle not knowing, right? It's the, it's the not knowing. It's the closure where I, I, you know, keep saying yes to this work, even though I find it very challenging because I know how important closure is, you know. And I'm not talking about the people that say, oh, you know, he was probably killed by a car or, oh, you know, he's wandered off. And then they stop looking. In the meantime, their cat's out there needing help or they end up at the animal shelter weeks later but the person doesn't even come to look because they've already given up on their animal and moved on and this is you know a timing i've mentioned this earlier where the person doesn't start um, searching right away or they give up searching too soon and this is a huge problem with animals um, another one is lack of support from partners spouses or family support and i hear this a lot where people are um, really unhinged because they're spending so much time looking for their animal um, and people in their lives are not very supportive they say oh you know it's just a cat or it's just a dog just get another one and of course that is not very kind you know this is life um, and, and it's not it's not um, it's not very helpful you know to keep doing this another myth I see is that people say you know spread vacuum clear, uh, cleaner bag content around your home um, you know this is crazy and there is no short of crazy advice out there including that you the person needs to stay outside in your yard um, you know I don't recommend this um, it's not sanitary to sprinkle shit all over your over your um, garden and it's certainly not helpful to your cat. And the, the crux of this is it's actually a waste of energy that you could actually put in your focus into things that actually do work and are practical. Practical, um, you know. But I think the danger in all of this is to do things that are ineffective. And people have a limited amount of energy and time during the day, you know. And when you hit that wall, you're done. So we don't want you wasting your energy when you could be putting your energy into 
effective search techniques, okay, on top of the gestalt tracking. So I really want you to get that. <coughs> um, you know, let's talk about um, some of the behaviors of finders that prevent cats from getting back home because this is the one that I call the finder keeper syndrome where people very quickly get attached to an animal. We all do it. Um, you know, in the shelters, kittens come in and everyone's like, oh my God, they're so cute. And people bond instantly to animals that are hurt and who are in need. And it's not kind to the, the animal, especially if you found an animal in your neighborhood um, and you don't know where they've come from. But then we get into these beliefs and these judgments where we go, huh, and we're all righteous and saying, oh, this person doesn't deserve to have an animal because they're not taking care of it. Or, oh my gosh, this person isn't. Uh, taken care of and I've seen this many times where the finder actually gives the owner a hard time about why their animal went missing um, you know and 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 that's not okay um, and then there's this rescue mentality where all people think that animals need to be rescued and and this of course is not true so whether you believe one thing or another this is really the way it is cats are outside it's never going to change Dogs like to run when the gate's left over. And most of the time, you know, people finding animals believe that they're not being taken care of or that, they're, that they don't have an owner. And they don't take them to a shelter. They don't report them as found. And I've seen people give people's pets away or adopt them out or foster them out without actually doing the groundwork first. Um, and we don't want that either, you know. And I've had... Um, people, thanks to a microchip, find an animal that's been missing five or ten years later in a completely different area because perhaps that animal was found and adopted out or given away and nobody ever checked for a chip or tried to contact the owner. Um, you know, and then there's just the lack of the knowledge of the system. And I know some people mean well um, and they just don't know what to do. Okay, so I'm not judging anybody, but they find an animal. They don't know anything about animal shelters, so they find an animal they think needs help and then they give it to some friend of theirs that don't that has animals and this can also be a problem because they get integrated back in and we're out there still looking for the animal okay so you know this is this is super simple too um is to know that you know we all have biases and they do affect us in ways that we're sometimes not aware of we'd like to believe they don't we'd like to think that we're kind um but we all do have biases from our upbringing, from our experience with, with people who, that we interact with, and from experiences where we see horrendous, um, terrible things being done to animals. And, you know, if we see something and it's, you know, it's automatically, oh my gosh, this cat looks unwell, they're abused, they're neglected. And, you know, unfortunately, I've lost some of my older cats in their last couple of years. And the way that I've looked at the last six months of their lives People from the outside might have looked at my animals and not know that they're 17 year olds and had cancer and think I'm a terrible owner, you know, that I should put them out of their misery. And so I totally get that. You know, a lot of people believe that the cats have been abandoned or dumped, you know. Um, and yes, some people do dump animals, but it doesn't happen as often as we think. And I think this is where we need to soften our hearts and come back into compassion because words have power, you know. Um, think of bullying, you know, words become thoughts, which become actions. And if we believe that these cats or these animals are abandoned, dumped, neglected, abused, are we really going to take the effort to consider finding the owners? Probably not. You know, so this is where we really have to step back from it. Because when you think lost, rather than that, now it's a totally different paradigm. Now we're going to make an effort to find the owner. You're going to check the lost cat uh, folders at your vet. You're going to search for the microchip. You're going to join um, lost and missing cat Facebook groups, you know. And there is a process where you can just make more phone calls, call some more registries, call the vets, call the shelters, um, call your local network, you know. And sometimes just making one phone call can make a huge difference. You can post a flyer from where the cat um, was found. The veterinarians often have a book of missing cats or, or found cats, you know, and, and this is a great way to, to really actively participate rather than worrying. So, you know, post flyers and 
widen your range as well because a lot of times um, people don't think to look at shelters and it's because of that flyer that they actually consider it. So I want to just recap and look at a couple new of more, more, more practical steps, okay, where we can really support cats being uh, reunited with their owners. So, you know, the one is, and this is a very interesting and complex topic, and it's been very interesting when I've discussed this in areas that are not only doing it, but have never heard of it. Um, so I don't know, you know, who here um, can relate to this, or it's something that you're doing, or something you've never heard of, and I'd love you to post that in the comments below, because these things are all open for discussion. We can all learn. But the main thing a lot of people say is that, you know, um, we're making a decision, but we can't do that. And a lot of people will give me five different answers. And the treatment that every shelter is doing some kind of management of their intake. They're not just simply taking every animal in and helping every person that comes in the door. Um, because it's they can't. And, you know, the logic of admission is that you're taking in cats in order to help, right? Um, underage kittens, animals that are sick or, or injured. And you're also engaging the public. If you have underage um, kittens, you're getting people to foster. You're getting people to bottle feed. You know, you're not just letting people drop off, drop off, drop off cats, and then all of a sudden you're buried under a heap of cats. So it's very important to look at the laws. It's another thing I hear a lot about um, is people say, oh, no, well, they can't do that because the law requires that. So what is the law actually saying? You know, get informed. Ask your shelter and, and look at some of the places and things that people believe that they're required to do in order to take cats. You know, there's always a workaround. And also you get to decide the process of how you follow the mandate. And also laws can be changed. And each city and each town, each shelter and agency, uh, they understand that you in the shelter, in the volunteer park, are the ones that have to follow these mandates, you know, for things to work. So it's really up to you to create the process to go to your leadership and say, this is how we're going to do it. Because the way that we're doing it doesn't work. Okay, and this is where we need to let emotions aside and actually be open to what else is possible. Um, you know, the majority of cats that I've seen recovered have all been found very close to, to home. You know, I've had my own cat that was picked up and brought to a shelter. She, he was just in the rain, you know, waiting to come home. He was literally a block from here. Um, you know, and, and luckily... I just happened to be there. Um, but my cat was pretty much sitting in front of his own house. He was never lost. And some well-meaning person took him off to a shelter that was miles away. Um, I had to do the practical work. 93% of cats find their way home. And only in one study, they said 7% of cats were recovered from animal shelters or sanctuaries. So, you know, a lot of times they're found in the community very close to, ha to home and um, you know this when you when you let cats it frees up the shelters to to really handle the cats and dogs that need the help right the ones that are being abused the ones that are emaciated um, so you know um, another thing about posting cats online this is another one where the, the internet can be a bit of a double-edged sword um, I do find that I get many um, owner owners looking through the internet but I also find people have become a little bit too reliant on the community that if they post something on Facebook, that's all they have to do. And you know, you know that it's not. But yes, it is important, especially in the shelters, to post the pictures of all the animals that are there. And there are still a lot of shelters out there that don't do this for whatever reason. They believe that, you know, people um, will steal animals. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me in today's times of technology and I think it's something very important especially for cats because if your black cat is picked up and taken to a shelter 25 kilometers away how are you going to know it's your black cat you know so again um, you want to be sure that all your animals literally have their mug shots in your file on your phone on your computer in case they do go missing that you have a good picture you know, where you can see their eyes, where you can see any specific markings on their bodies, anything that will 
um, show up as it's not just another black cat you know some personality traits um that we need to have a picture we need to have the location that it's found the gender is it muted are they intact you know we want as much possible information on an intake form and as much as the shelters do this you should have your own for each of your pets also you know if you find a cat tell people where you found the cat or the dog um, tell people how you can start to change the categories on these Facebook groups or online um, that can expand out a little bit, give more information. And, you know, people that say that they don't have time to take a photo, I don't, I don't see any reason why they can't. But unfortunately, as I said, there's a lot of people that are in shelters and sanctuaries that are delaying vaccinations and they delay doing the paperwork um, because of that. So just know that, you know, Facebook groups are a great addition so that you can post and, and people can know if you found a pet or if you lost a pet. But don't rely on it as the be all and end all of everything. Also, you know, talking about cats' behaviors, it's very important in shelters to have staff and volunteers that manage to work with the public, you know, on the meet and greet days. Um, you know, it's kind of like having a car accident. All of a sudden you have all these things to deal with and it's not something that maybe you've done before and you're grieving because your animals got lost and now you have all these problems. And to expect somebody to know exactly what to do in that situation is first of all unrealistic. Um, you know, and it's just a culmination of all of these things that compound, that decrease the chances of re reuniting the, the, the animal with their person you know and I'm super excited about the missing cat study that was done with the, the University of Queensland Veterinary Science um, Jackie Rand who was the head of that study did a presentation um, at a recent conference in Australia um, where where it was really reaching organizations and I think this study should be published very soon um, which have the preliminary results and finding of some of the things that a lot of the collective believed anecdotally that, like for one, that cats are always close to home. So there's a lot of great information in this um, where people are missing their cats, they're looking for, for them and how they're finding them. And I'm really excited to share that information with you very soon. So you'll find that in the resource section of Vital Animal Talk and on my website when it comes out. You know, another thing is um, that, there, that we want to engage more volunteers. Um, I want to engage people that are going to help people to be through the process so that when people come in the door to the shelter looking for a missing cat, that there's somebody that, that, that cares and somebody that can provide support, a lot of it grief support. Because what I find is that when we counsel people on these missing cases, it's not some specific thing that I've told them um, that's caused them to find their pet. But they often say later on that just talking to me, just knowing that I was out there actively looking with them, they didn't give up hope. They didn't stop going to the shelters. They didn't, they didn't stop looking. And this is the most important ingredient, I think, is to keep people in the space of hope, um, which the pet intuitively picks up anyway because of that heart-to-heart -heart connection. So, you know, this, this would be a beautiful start, and I think it's so important because we can counsel anybody on the phone, um, you know, on the steps and the behaviors, on effective search techniques, and it's all on my website, um, you know, what to do when your pet goes missing. But I think it's really important within the communities um, of shelters, of volunteers, that they understand the demographics of the weather, of the terrain, and, you know, I wouldn't... I don't know sometimes what the weather is like in Texas or in um, in Cape Town today, but having that community that I'm tied into and a solid foundation, um, you know, when it's very hot here and can be extremely cold in the high felt in the winters, um, having at people that know the terrain um, is very helpful for me in how we can support people when they're tracking their missing animals and, and looking for them. So, you know, these are some of the things that volunteers at shelters can do and some of the ways that I assist volunteers to become uh, a greater contribution. Um, you know, posting the signs, distributing flyers, con connecting with an animal communicator that, that has a good success rate with lost animals. Um, all of this is, it's a culmination 
of pragmatic tools to use and energy medicine as well. And you know what? Even if if some people can help and some people can't, um, you know, a lot of elderly people, all they have is their cats and, their, and all these people need help and they need compassion, you know, and this is really what, what I want to do is, is assist the shelters and the sanctuaries to get more volunteers involved, to assist with the paperwork. You know, this is where people are inundated with, with things and, and the, the reports aren't done or the paperwork is behind and, and so many animals slip through the loops of this because the paperwork hasn't been done or that phone call hasn't been followed up. And I've had my own horror stories of that happening in my own adoption process and on my own searching for my own animals and for my clients. So every little bit helps. And I think it's really important in all of this because I've given you a lot of information. But I think if you make it a priority, this is the bottom line. It's always going to be a win-win for you, for the animals, for the people in the in the um, sanctuaries, all of it. It all is a great win-win. And the world needs you, you know, and, and I just want you to know that you're welcome to contact me anytime. Um, you can join the Facebook group Vital Animal Talk and stay connected with the resources and the tools. And if you're watching this um, on the replay or on my website or you found me somewhere else, be sure to um, be sure to contact me. Um, join the this community of kind people that are really helping themselves so that they can better help and support their animals and the animals that are in need in volunteer positions and shelters and you know veterinaries wherever you are in the world just know that you're not alone um connecting to communities that want want that's that believe in a world where people treat animals with more compassion and kindness and um just remember you know sometimes cats are best left where they are um so really ask some questions and 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 if your animals are left, are lost start talking to your animals put your flyers up uh, check in with your vets regularly do the groundwork and if you want to know what that is um, go to my website download the what to do if my cat if my animal goes missing um, there's a pdf sheet there that's pretty concise and if you have any other questions regarding keeping your animals vital happy and healthy or if you need support in um the grieving process if you have have just lost a pet or you want any other information that is related to um, your animal um, your animal companion's health and vitality and your own please feel free to reach out and touch me uh, I'm here for you and I I I am and there um, to be the voice for the voiceless and also for the people that are advocating and, and standing for a, a more compassionate world where all animals are treated with regard and um, the honoring and the reverence of being sentient beings. All right, thank you for joining me and I will see you inside the portal over at Animal Talk, Vital Animal Talk on Facebook or as I said, on sarahjanefarrell.com you can also take the dosha quiz there to find out what your animal's uh, predominant dosha or um, characteristic type is and it's also great to know what yours is so that when you're when you're in relationship with your animal you can deepen those relationships and and have a two-way conversation um, it's also a great way to know what your dosha type is and what your animals that you already have doshas are so that if you're thinking of bringing another animal in to your home that that the integration is seamless because all of the different dosha personalities uh, support and grow each other so that's it for me um, keep loving keep sharing and um, if you love this video and you know somebody that could could do with hearing it please like it share it and let's get let's get get it out there um, and leave the world a better place than we found it. Thank you.